Hello, welcome. My name is Carol Shaw, and I am an assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. I've been engaged in research with our ASD Career Links project in looking at the best way to support adults with autism spectrum disorder in community employment. Today's presentation will explore exactly how we support adults with autism spectrum disorders related to positive behavior supports. In the context of today's workshop, I will present two case studies to illustrate the procedures and the processes that we use when we're supporting adults with autism spectrum disorders. Again, thank you for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you on the chat portion of this webcast. Our Autism Spectrum Disorder Career Links Project is a project through the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. It is um, centered at Virginia Commonwealth University's Research Rehabilitation and Training Center. It, we are researching vocational models that support individuals with ASD in acquiring and maintaining employment. This is an important research area because there's little research to date on how best to support individuals with autism spectrum disorders. Also, what we found throughout the research is as a group, individuals with autism spectrum disorders are frequently left out of the employment picture. We have yet to develop really good ways to support individuals with autism at work. And so this research attempts to answer this question in one of four ways. In relationship to our work, we are collaborating with partners here in Virginia. Specifically, we are working with the Virginia Department of Rehabilitative Services, Henrico County Public Schools here in Central Virginia. The, the Faison School for Autism is a private school um, that serves individuals with autism exclusively. Our business partner in this work is Bon Secours Richmond Health System. And then finally, we are collaborating with the Cincinnati Children's Hospital to implement their project search model related to employment of people with developmental disabilities. In our project, we are working exclusively with individuals with autism spectrum disorders to explore the exact nature of supports necessary and to test whether or not the project search model is a viable model for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. The purpose of the study, as I mentioned earlier, is to identify vocational rehabilitation service models that are supportive of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. In this specific aspect of our research, we are examining the impact of intensive community-based work through the project search model. This is a randomized controlled trial, and so we are using a control group to assess whether or not the impact of participation in project search and the related employment outcomes are in fact due to the intervention or and ruling out other um, factors that might influence uh, someone becoming employed upon graduation from high school. For our purposes, we are going to review our work related to two students who are currently employees in the Bon Secours Richmond Health System. These two employees went to Project Search for a year and then subsequently became employed. Through their I internships and then also through their employment, we have provided behavior supports to them. At this point, these individuals have been successfully employed for two full years and are in a follow-along status in terms of their service delivery model. The first young man that I'm going to reference is Terry. And I begin with a description of Terry related to his IEP prior to joining us in Pro Project Search. I'm doing this to illustrate the difference between what an individual might have through services at a, in a school system versus services in a community-based vocational model, such as Project Search. For Terry, prior to coming to Project Search, he had a number of functional skills related to math and reading. Now, for the most part, these functional skills were academic in nature and were not directly related to activities in which he would engage on, his, on a daily basis. For example, in looking at his practical math goals, he uh, worked on visual recognition and identification of fractions. Um, these 
skills, while important in a school-based setting, are not necessarily life skills. If Terry doesn't recognize fractions in his life in the community, no one will have to do that for him. Counting mixed money, however, is a life skill. Although, as we all know today, many of us go without actually carrying change. And so today, most of us maintain purchases through the use of paper money or more often through the use of debit or credit cards. And so counting money is even beginning to become somewhat less of the functional skill that we originally thought of it as. In terms of functional reading, Terry worked on identifying information presented in real life materials. Now that is a very functional goal. And as it relates to his um, future employment, this is a goal that we continue to work on in a embedded way through the project search. Probably of important note are the vocational skills. Now Terry is a young man with autism who um, demonstrates many of the characteristics um, Terry is able to communicate and communicate independently and spontaneously. However, he is not particularly adept at communicating the most important things. For example, he's not adept at asking for help, for expressing when he's frustrated, for expressing when he needs a break. And so, because he was unable to communicate those very important things, we saw in his project search work that he was having some challenging behaviors related to the, that communication deficit. Nevertheless, in his school-based program, they had him working on vocational skills such as sorting, matching, increasing his work speed, and following a task list to completion. As you see him move from this student to employee, what you will notice is that these are very low level skills in the uh, sequence of skills that he needed to master. That these in fact are, if I can use an analogy, like learning the letter A and then expecting someone to read. Sorting is a part of someone's work day. And most of us at some point or another during our day sort. We sort email based on priority. We sort um, work materials. Uh, but for the most part, that's a very, very small portion of our workday. And so when you look at someone's vocational goals, who's a senior in high school, getting ready to graduate and enter the workforce, sorting and matching are not fully marketable skills. They are part of a sequence of skills that could equal a marketable job, but would not necessarily result in employment. This may be one of the factors that leads to individuals with autism um, having such low employment rates upon graduation from high school. Nevertheless, um, it's important for us to take a view of where students with autism spectrum disorders leave school and as they enter the workforce what skills they might need to work on. Clearly Terry has to move beyond sorting and matching before he can fully enter the workforce. Finally, Terry did have a community-based component to his uh, academic day in high school, and that resulted in seven hours a week of internship-like employment, um, community-based learning on um, work sites. And another point that is important for us to pay attention to for students with autism spectrum disorders is that that amount of time is not enough practice for Terry to fully gain the skills that he needs to be a successful employee. Our second student is Adam. Adam is a young man who has more academic abilities as compared with Terry. We would refer to Adam as someone with um, higher functioning cognitive abilities. And as you look at Adam's goals, what you see is that he indeed is working on some higher level academic skills related to language arts, reading comprehension, math, and some of his vocational skills. Again, as you look at the skills that, ma that Adam is working on, it's fair to ask the question, as a senior in high school, is phonemic development an important skill for Adam to have? Would Adam have to have someone else do this skill for him if he didn't have it? As we got to know Adam, we concluded that in fact, he is quite independent in reading basic materials that give him information and that also provide him with entertainment. 
He was quite able to read the sports page in the newspaper and comprehend well how his favorite teams were doing. He also was able to read important work-related materials such as schedules, bus schedules, his work schedule, and he was also able to read and comprehend basic work forms. He needed some assistance when he was signing up for some of his benefits and signing up for his W-9. That's not unusual in the world of work, and so the employee services, the um, Human Resources Department, had someone available to him. This was a natural support that is available to anyone who's signing up for uh, benefits while they're employed. So as we see Adam moving from a student to an employee, what we see in his IEP in his set senior year is that he still has some skills that, while academic, are not necessarily functional. It's in the senior year for students with autism spectrum disorders that we really have to probe whether or not the skills that we're teaching are absolutely essential to the person's lifelong success. And for Adam, some of the skills indeed were very helpful. His work in reading related to WH questions was an important aspect of, of him understanding how to communicate effectively with others. However, his work in learning sound blends and phonemic development was not as necessary. As we look at his vocational skills, we see some important social skills related to Adam's success in employment, and they include responding to authority. We had to define that in a much more measurable way when we began to work with him in our project search internship sites. Um, we also found that for Adam, it wasn't so much his response to authority that was problematic, but understanding the, the subtle social context of interaction with boss versus coworker that was most important. And so for Adam, we began to work on specific social skills related to how to interact with your boss. Um, we also found that Adam was, when motivated and when he understood the purpose of his tasks, he independently began tasks all the time. We, we hypothesized that in a school-based setting, he was probably asked to do, and we can see in the vocational skills, that he was in fact doing skills that were somewhat under his ability. And so no wonder he was questioning authority when he was being asked to sort, match, and speed up his work. He was probably bored by the tasks that he was doing in the vocational skills portion of his academic day. And so what we find is that again with Adam in his high school program as a senior, he was not working to his full ability. By entering his project search internship, we were able to challenge him on a much more meaningful level and many of the behaviors that were originally identified in his IEP were not problematic for him. Again, you see, as with Terry, Adam's IEP included only seven hours a week of community-based employment internships. For someone with autism spectrum disorders, as a learner, we know that these individuals require intensive practice and repeated practice in order to be successful in their jobs. Seven hours per week for the 40 weeks that school is in session is not enough time for even someone as skilled as Adam to acquire the skills. By entering an all-day internship practice, uh, internship such as Project Search, Adam was able to practice these important skills on a day-to-day -day basis. The number of opportunities that he had to practice interactions with supervisors, interactions with coworkers, and to practice important social skills like accepting correction was much higher in a project search replication where the internship lasted for four hours a day, 20 hours a week versus only seven hours a week. We'll speak more about that as we look at exactly how project search is delivered in the context of our community-based setting. Prior to getting into Project Search, though, I just want to reiterate for a moment the important characteristics related to autism spectrum disorders. Currently, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, 4th edition, still includes three symptom categories. They are social interaction, communication, and patterns of behavior. In future editions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, we expect the social interaction and communication symptom groups to become one and be referred to as social communication. For right now, though, we'll look at the three of those.
For students like Terry and Adam, what we find is the nonverbal social interaction is impacted greatly. Both Terry and Adam don't pick up on subtle social cues such as looking down or checking your watch or backing away that indicates that you're done talking to someone. So if you're Terry or Adam's supervisor and they're asking you a question, they may not know or understand that you have to move on by those social su subtle those subtle social signals. And so frequently we instruct supervisors to be very clear verbally with students like, well, then interns and employees like Terry and Adam. For example, we in instructed Terry's supervisor to tell Terry, I do not have any more time to work. It's time for me to walk away. And that helped Terry understand what was expected of him. Once his question was answered, he was then able to move on and get back to work. Peer relationships are frequently impacted. For Adam, this was a big problem, and we'll talk about that related to specific behaviors that he displayed that were problematic. Ter Adam didn't understand how to maintain and develop friendships among his coworkers, and that the friendships that he made with coworkers were different than the friendships that he had with his peers in high school. And so he had to learn how to interact with peers differently in the context of work. In terms of communication, both of these young men were fully able to communicate, but there were differences and oddities in the way they communicated. For example, Adam didn't talk very much. He failed to express his frustration using words. He was not adept at asking for a break when he needed one. Terry would frequently talk about being sick instead of saying, I'm frustrated or I'm confused. And so for Terry, his ability to speak did not result in his ability to effectively use communication. We refer to that as pragmatic communication. Also, both of these young men had difficulty with symbolic language. As I mentioned earlier, Adam had difficulty understanding cliches. So some of the work cliches that supervisors are prone to use were confusing to Adam. That, in fact, became a part of problem behaviors related to Adam. Both of these young men have patterns of behavior that make them interesting, and that um, both of them have oddities in the way they move and sometimes are prone to um, spin in circles, flap, or engage in repeated behaviors like repeatedly checking the dates on um, one of Adam's job is to change the Purell containers in the hospital. It's a really important job in the era of um, diseases like uh, swine flu and, and MRSA. And so Adam, that's a good thing that Adam is repeatedly checking those dates, it makes him a very thorough employee. So sometimes the patterns of behavior that we see as problematic in school settings are desirable in work settings. Both of these young men had difficulty related to the secondary characteristics associated with autism. Specifically, both of them displayed challenging behavior that impacted their success at work. Also, um, Terry in particular had difficulty with anxiety that actually did result in some need for mental health services. Finally, Adam had some sensory sensitivities and sens sens uh, sensory differences that made it necessary for us to assist him in figuring out how best to meet his sensory needs in the context of work. As I mentioned, both of these young men uh, were in Project Search for a full school year. Project Search is a senior year transition program that is housed in a large business, a large business such as a hospital or a bank. In Terry and Adam's case, they were both placed in a hospital, specifically in Bon Secours Richmond Health System, St. Mary's Hospital. Um, Again, we look for large businesses because these become microcosm communities. Large businesses like a hospital have every single job that exists in the larger community. There's an engineering department. There's a food services department. There is a financial department. There are plenty of needs for materials and stocking. There are lots of needs for people who have general skills and also people who have specialized skills. For the, both of these young men, they only spent about an hour and 45 minutes in their classroom, 
The rest of the day, they rotated through three different internships across the year. In their internships, they worked fully as if they were employees without fully taking an employee responsibility or role. They, they learned portions of employee work in portions of a job through each of their internship rotations. Each internship was about 10 weeks long. And again, this compare this 20 hours of internship to the seven hours per week of internship that both of these young men had in their high school programs. In other words, we are able to provide them with intensive experiences related to employment. Using this business model, it's important to note that there are single points of contracts and single points of contacts. And so we worked within our business to have one job coaching agency provide job coaching services. There was one school participating and our, our students were interns and not volunteers. This is a very important change of word for not only the staff who supported our interns, but also for the business themselves. Hospitals have lots of volunteers, and the volunteers are not paid, and they never look for jobs. However, hospitals do have interns as well, and the expectation with an intern is that they're there to learn specific job skills, and that if they're successful in their learning, they will be hired at the conclusion of their internship. That's indeed something that we worked on as we supported these students in their internships. One of the things we do in this business model is we create a need in the business. So if an intern is particularly successful in an internship and the business says, we'd like that person to engage in a second internship, we say to them, well, this person is looking for a job and if you have a job opening, they are more than happy to interview for that job. However, they're unable to engage in a second internship because they have other skills to learn. In other words, we leave that department without an intern for a semester so that they begin to look at their budget and say, we really do need someone with that skill set. Let's go back and hire Adam or Terry because we need them on our team. We talk about potential employment at every single evaluation point, and our interns in this model are evaluated frequently. So every time we meet with the employer at two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we say, would you hire them? Do you have any job openings? And if you wouldn't hire them, what skills do you think they need to work on? Finally, and most importantly for students with autism spectrum disorders, we're really looking at match. Match is both looking at the job itself as well as the soft side of the job. For example, we've had some very good matches related to job skills, but not good matches related to the soft side of the skills, where the individual with autism may have to um, have more customer interaction than would be desirable. And so we want to look at both the match between the person and the job and the match between the person and the other people around whom they'll work. That's an important aspect of our work when we're supporting individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Another aspect of the project search model is collaboration. This is essential and we find it to be one of the most helpful aspects of supporting seniors who are moving from school to work. Specifically, we want to work with everyone who has a role in making sure that when this person is employed upon graduation, that employment is maintained and continued. And so that includes rehabilitative services. In fact, what we see in Project Search is a melding of the school-based service model with the employment-based service model. And so while the school provides the teacher, the classroom, and specific education around job, job getting and job maintaining skills, we have job coaches provided by the Department of Rehabilitative Services to meet the needs of students related to their internships. So it really fully is a seamless transition. At the end of this year, we don't have to hold a meeting where we tell employment services about the student because the students already known having been in school and in employment for a year. So this is almost like the student has one foot in school and one foot in the, the community-based employment world. It works out very well that way for students with autism in particular. In addition, we work with the family 
In fact, our first week of school, uh, we, f we frequently have to drive family members home because they're afraid to let their um, children, who are now young adults, with autism go to work on their own. They want to be there every step of the way and it's almost like the, um, it's almost helping that family adjust to the, uh, the reality that that individual is going to go to work and be successful at work. We at the university are providing consultation in best practices and most specifically in behavior support, the purpose of this webcast today. And so um, I just want to draw your attention to an article that I wrote in 2010. It was published in the Journal of Vocational Rehabilitation, which reviews this, this and, and is a nice companion piece to this webcast that I'm presenting today. The challenges that we have in providing behavior supports at work relate to the nature of work. Um, it's very visible and public. When a person with autism spectrum disorder dis displays a problematic or odd behavior at work, it's in that visual and public context. People who are visiting the business, in this case a hospital, to receive services as a patient or to visit a family member are present all the time. There, there, are, there is no place in the hospital where you're not in public view. And so as we provide behavioral supports, we have to be mindful of that both ways. We have to be mindful that behaviors that occur in this context are going to be viewed by this general public and be evaluated by them. We also have to be mindful that the supports that we provide should not look extremely different. So the idea of using stickers or, or check sheets where an adult might follow a, another coworker and give them checks for doing a good job, that's not a good match. And so when we're working on getting people to seniors in high school, we really have to consider how do we provide reinforcement so that individual doesn't look vastly different than their employees. We have to also keep in mind that the people who are there to provide support are not trained in behavioral methodology. And so our support people are coworkers and the person's supervisor. They don't understand words like differential reinforcement or um, variable contingencies. And so when we're working with coworkers and supervisors, we have to have supports that they could implement readily without having master's degrees in applied behavior analysis. There's the pressure to perform at work, and so we don't have a long time to work someone through a lot of challenging behavior and work them back into the workplace. So what we do with the individual in the work context has to be quick, effective, and efficient. We have fewer trained staff available, whereas in school you might have a, a teacher, a paraprofessional, a um, speech pathologist, you might have an assistant principal or a department chair of special education available to assist an individual in managing their behavior. At work, we have a job coach who has many other people that they have to see in the context of a day, so we just have fewer trained staff available. There's a lack of access to positive behavior support services, and so we have to figure out ways to provide positive behavior support as a vendored service in the context of, de of rehabilitative services. And then finally, what we do has to fit with the values of the business. We can't be disrupting the business. We can't be engaging in procedures or practices that look so vastly different from what happens at the business that the business looks different in the view of their customers. And so we really have to consider the contextual fit of what we do in the context of the business itself. As a process, we start with a person-centered plan approach or a person-centered thinking approach is probably more likely. We always ask ourselves as we're supporting someone when they present a challenging behavior, is this behavior the result of a mismatch between the person and their skills and the environment in which they're performing? If that's the case, we change the internship or we change the environment before we attempt any process to evaluate the person themselves. We then engage in an indirect assessment process. This includes identifying and defining the behavior, interviewing the previous team, and then reviewing the history of that behavior over the life of that person. Our second step then would be to, to engage in direct assessment. 
we observe the behavior in the environments in which it occurs and in which it does not occur. In this case, we're looking to try to figure out what are the antecedents that precede the behavior or somehow trigger the behavior, and then what the function of that behavior in that environment might be. Finally, we develop a hypothesis, and as you see with each of our interns, Adam and Terry, we have that hypothesis be in a specific, specific format, and we actually formulate a single sentence about each behavior that begins with the word when, we, after the word when, we describe the antecedent or the conditions that are present that either trigger the behavior or occur just before the behavior occurs. We then describe the behavior itself in very specific terms. And then finally, we identify the function of that behavior by noting that the behavior occurs in order to get attention, avoid undesirable tasks, or some other function. Once we've completed this, we use the competing behavior model to assist us in identifying the, the sequence of events that lead to the problem behavior so that we can then identify a replacement behavior and then also a desired behavior. In each one of these, what we're looking to do is to replace the problem behavior with a new behavior that serves the same function. And then finally, we teach the desired behavior, which usually requires some level of tolerance of discomfort. And so what we're doing is we're teaching a replacement behavior. So as you, as you look at Terry, what you'll find out is that some of his behavior was related to the desire to avoid unpleasant tasks. And a logical replacement behavior is teaching him to ask for a break. But if all he ever learns is to ask for a break, then he doesn't learn how to tolerate completing an undesired task at work. So the desired behavior is to try to complete the task. And so what we find is, while we're teaching him to ask for a break, we're also teaching him how to complete the task successfully, and we're increasing the reinforcement available to him for completing that task. It's basically a three-step process once we're at the point where we're teaching new behaviors. The three-step process that we specifically use when we're teaching new behaviors includes preventing the behavior from occurring in the first place, and that means that we alter the antecedents to prevent the problem behavior from occurring. We teach the replacement behaviors, and we also teach the desired behaviors, and then finally we respond differently to the problem behavior and to the new behaviors. We want to weaken the problem behavior while making the new behaviors stronger, and we weaken the problem behavior by removing the reinforcement from the problem behavior itself and then applying that reinforcement to the new behavior. Illustration will help make this much more clear. And so we begin with Terry, who has autism and anxiety. As I mentioned earlier, Terry did have some secondary symptoms associated with autism. Anxiety occurs at much, anxiety disorders specifically, occur at much higher rates in adults with autism. And so for Terry, this resulted in behaviors that included frequent questions, and those frequent questions were directed to coworkers and supervisors to find out if he was engaging in the correct task at the correct time and eliciting a lot of praise for the work that he was doing. Terry would also help patients, and I have that in quotes, because Terry was working in nutrition. And what helping patients was he really wanted to transport patients who were in wheelchairs or who were on gurneys. That's a trained position for which he did not have training. And, and it's also a position that requires that the person do display a high degree of competence because of the um, liability ramifications for the hospital. And so consequently, if Terry engaged in, quote, helping a patient who was in a wheelchair, having been untrained but still being at the hospital, that actually increases the hospital's liability. And so that becomes problematic in the context of him completing his job. Um, when he um, had problems at work, he would cry, and an interesting behavior that he engaged in related to anxiety was complaining of heart palpitations. Now, this behavior served two functions as we analyzed it. First, he got a lot of attention from some very caring people in the hospital. Here he was working in the hospital complaining that he was having a heart attack. 
Lots of people paid attention and he ended up in the ER on a couple of occasions. Now, I'm not saying that if he's complaining of heart palpitations, we shouldn't pay attention, but we had affirmed that he had no heart complications whatsoever. He was a healthy and fit 20-year-old young man and had no heart problems whatsoever. His heart palpitations, as he described them, were in fact his anxiety. And so he got a lot of attention and he also escaped tasks in the context of complaining about heart palpitations. This is a, um, I have a few pictures of Terry working in um, nutrition services. So the, the two problem behaviors that were most visible in the context of his work were complaining of illnesses and heart problems and crying. We interviewed his previous school team because this was the first year we were providing support to Terry. And they reported that he was just fine, that he just worried a lot, and you just got to work with him kind of. Well. The problem with that approach at work was that these behaviors were really standing in the way of him being successful. Crying at work resulted in his supervisor avoiding him. The more his supervisor avoids working with him, the less his supervisor considers him a viable employee. And so as we work to find employment for Terry, we really have to figure out what, are the, what is the function of his crying and how can we teach him a new behavior so that he avoids crying. We observed him using antecedent behavior consequence or ABC recording. And what we found out was that the antecedent to crying and complaining of heart palpitations was making an error that required a correction or when he encountered a problem at work. A problem such as not being able to find his materials or not being able to engage in a task that he was assigned. And so he was essentially using these behaviors to avoid correction and to avoid problems. So um, Terry's, the hypotheses, and these are the hypotheses that I referred to earlier, were that when he is corrected, he will cry uncontrollably in order to avoid correction and elicit help. And then when he encounters a problem in finding his work item materials, he will wander around, go to the cafeteria, eat an extra breakfast, and help patients in order to fill his time. Terry is a very dedicated worker and wanted to stay busy. And he saw helping patients as a helpful way. But again, this was a behavior. I, it sounds like a really good behavior, but in the context of the hospital, this was a behavior that actually risked him not getting a job. And so these are subtle behaviors and small behaviors, and they're not the big ones like the hitting and the screaming and the tantruming, although the crying got kind of close. These were behaviors that if you were to see them in school, you would think, oh, he's a very helpful young man. But in the world of work, it's very important that you do what your supervisor tells you to do, not what you want to do. So in terms of our prevention strategies, remember we want to prevent these behaviors from occurring. We worked on the match between the job that Terry was engaging in and consistency. It was mainly during downtimes that we saw him wandering and attempting to help patients. And so we had to find a job that kept him busy. And there are plenty of jobs to keep him busy at the hospital. So we were able to look at the, the match of a job. For Terry, downtime is not a good thing. That's when he's most likely to get in trouble helping others. Likewise, we designed a lot of visual supports to assist him in completing tasks. We provided him with a very specific schedule for the day so that he understood what he was expected to do and how to complete his tasks effectively in the, in the workplace. What we found for Terry and for many of our students with autism is giving verbal instructions is not the most effective way to help them understand how to complete tasks. And so in order to increase his ability to complete tasks, successfully, we provided him with a, a daily schedule that he was able to follow. This schedule included some pictures, but mostly some written words as well. We taught Terry to accept correction and to solve problems using a picture sequence. Accepting correction, we actually provided him with four steps, and the steps were listen, repeat back what your supervisor said, do it, check, did I do it correctly? So we gave him four steps that he could follow when he um, was accepting correction. 
we practice that sequence three to four times a day with Terry so that he became very adept at the sequence required when he was accepting a correction. We would introduce these, section, these sessions by saying, Terry, let's practice accepting a correction. This became a clue to him or a key word to him so that he could display the behaviors that we just described. Now, um, for Terry, this became helpful because then we said to his supervisors, when you have to correct him, start by saying, Terry, let's practice accepting correction. So real corrections in the work environment became practice sections for him. And Terry was able to display those four behaviors fluidly and efficiently whenever he was corrected on his job. Finally, we gave Terry a self-monitoring checklist. This was a checklist that he carried with him where he could check off behaviors and assure, assure us that during the morning and then again during the afternoon, he displayed the behaviors that we expected of him. So one of the behaviors to address trying to help patients who, who required help and who were in wheelchairs was that we taught him to get a nurse when someone asked for help. We taught him to be on time by following his schedule, and so that was one of the behaviors that he checked himself off on. And then finally, you'll notice on the slide that it says, I use the private bathroom. As an employee, Terry was required to use the private and not the public bathroom. He had some social skill difficulties in the public bathroom where there were stalls. Specifically, he would peek through to see if people were completed in the bathroom because he had difficulty waiting for the bathroom himself. Um, and that was a huge problem. The people in the hospital didn't like it when Terry was peeking through. So it was important for us to teach him as an employee to use the private bathroom. Also, with Terry's permission, we taught his co-workers and his supervisor about his disability. I, and when we did that, that assisted them in understanding how best to interact with Terry. Um, this was a very important aspect of his plan because his supervisors would talk too fast, would not write down their instructions for Terry, and would not give him their instructions in small steps. Terry really did need his work stepped out for him, and so that was a support we taught his um, supervisors to do. We collected data on the number of times Terry cried and the number of times Terry um, complained about heart palpitations. Prior to the intervention, you can see that there was a high frequency of these behaviors occurring, and we took monthly totals, by the way. And so um, you can see that there were seven to 10 episodes per month between the months of September and December where Terry cried or complained of heart palpitations. Now, these are big episodes, so seven to 10 of them in a month is a lot. Once we implemented the intervention of preventing the problem behaviors from occurring with the schedule, teaching Terry how to accept corrections, and then implementing the self-monitoring checklist, we saw a very nice decrease in his problem behaviors. Um, we have some challenges collecting data. Frequently when you see data graphs like that, you'll see that these graphs are daily and they're based on sessions. Well, we don't have the plethora of regular staff to collect data. And so we have to rely on the reports of coworkers. So we have to do a lot of triangulating to try to figure out, was Terry really crying or is someone telling me of an episode that happened two weeks ago that we've already counted? So it took some time to figure out how best to collect the data. Um, we have problems in, in engaging in direct observation. It's a little odd to have people in a work environment with a clipboard counting the number of times someone engages in a problem behavior. And so we have to be careful about that uh, to respect the dignity of the person themselves. And so we found indirect ways to observe the challenges that occurred by eliciting the help of supervisors and also by um, giving Terry his self-monitoring checklist. Terry became an excellent reporter collecting his own data and reporting back to us on how things were going. We also had a weekly job coach observation which became a way for us to correlate Terry's observations with our own. And then finally we relied on Terry quite a bit to collect his own data. Um, as he moved into other internships he worked in environmental services um, and then he also worked in the laundry department of the hospital. 
He became very adept at the skills in each of these internships and, incur and encountered a great deal of success as in each of these as the year progressed. I'm happy to report that as an employee, Terry was hired by Nutrition Services. They were most pleased with his work, and two years later, he continues to work there, um, receiving a competitive wage, and he's very successfully employed. During his transition to employment, we saw a de decrease in Terry's following of his own schedule. We found that he was returning late from lunch, and he was also complaining that his work was too hard. Well, this was interesting to us because Terry really likes to work, and once he had his schedule, he followed it religiously. And so we were confused by these behaviors. So what we had to do was we had to go back and complete a second functional behavior assessment on these new behaviors that began to occur as he was employed. We found out that there were some smart people who were his co-workers in his division who figured out that Terry enjoyed pleasing others and actually began to assign him their work. We also found out that Terry didn't have a clear idea of what supervisor meant. He thought anyone working with him was his supervisor. And so he really wanted to make his supervisor happy. And so when we found him doing other people's work, we would say, Terry, why are you doing this job? And he would say, because my supervisor told me to. And we would say, well, which supervisor? He pointed to a coworker. Now, you can say, well, the job coach should have. The job coach should have made sure he knew who his supervisor was. In fact, the job coach did. The term supervisor is a social term. As a person with autism, Terry didn't understand that some people were supervisors and some people were coworkers, and there was a difference between those two people as it related to his work. And so we actually had to teach Terry the concept of supervisor. Supervisors don't have a crown. They don't have supervisor tattooed across their foreheads. They look like coworkers. And so Terry didn't understand that these people who were his supervisors had a different responsibility to him. So again, we implement this intervention by teaching him who his supervisor is, teaching him who to take directions from and who does not give him directions. We ensured that his schedule was set. We taught his supervisors how to correct him and how to interact with him. And yet again, we saw a tremendous decrease in the number of times that, um, in, in the percentage of time that Terry followed his schedule. And again, here we have weekly data because this was something we wanted to follow very closely. And with this, um, this, with this behavior chart as well, you can see that prior to the intervention, we see a fairly high weekly rate of not following schedule. After the intervention, we see that that drops down significantly. And so this is our way of verifying that the intervention was successful. Adam also presented some challenges related to um, being in the work environment related to the aspect of him having what we refer to as, quote, high-functioning autism. Um, he works best with guys because his behaviors are related to his interest and his perhaps social um, awkwardness with women. So what we found was that Adam had difficulties by rubbing on some of the, rubbing the shoulders of the women in his workplace. His initial internship match was not a good match for him. He was working in radiology. And the problem with radiology was that there was a lot of downtime for him while he was working there. And so there was a, a lot of time for him to hang out with coworkers, and that led to some problems related to social interaction. Um, I have a few pictures of, of Adam working in radiology. There he is with his team. And you can see that his arm is fully around the woman that he's standing next to. This was a young woman that he became good friends with and maybe sometimes was inappropriate with. Um, she's lovely and attractive and a delightful person. But we really had to work with Terry on the difference between a coworker and a friend. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I said Terry. This is Adam. Um, Adam's behaviors were included touching and rubbing other, others and the way they viewed this in, the, in his school team was that he's just a sweet young man and they didn't see this as a problem behavior. But those of you who work in employment know this is a huge problem behavior and it has a very specific name for which people are often fired and um, 
it, it's very problematic in the workplace. Um, so we observed Adam, and what we found out that when he's in close proximity to preferred female staff, that's a problem. And when he's attempting to interact with others and doesn't exactly know what to say, he'll touch them instead of saying something. And that, again, relates to the symptoms of his autism, that he's not extremely fluid in conversation, although he is um, better than many ind individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So we formulated our hypotheses um, related to interaction with preferred female staff. And then also, um, and we, we we saw this as a desire to gain positive attention, and then putting hands on co-workers at shoulder in order to maintain contact with him, with them when he didn't know what to say. We worked on job match here. Um, we want Adam to have good, positive interactions with others, but we don't want him to get in trouble. And so we identified that um, being with mainly men was a better match in terms of job because of the mentoring that would be available for him. We taught him the word professional. And for Adam, professional means hands to self and no touching others. And so we, we use this as a way to cue Adam. So when we say, Adam, be professional, he knows exactly what we mean. But other people don't know that we're cueing him about these unusual behaviors that, that might scare them or offend them. We also taught Adam some communication starters, like, how about that game? Or, do you think the Steelers will win the Super Bowl? So that he could engage in conversations that were socially appropriate at work without looking extremely different. We taught, again, with Adam's permission, we taught his coworkers and his supervisor about his disability, and we taught them to say to him, be professional. That became very effective. Um, he worked in engineering. Again, we identified um, areas of work where he would mainly be working with males, and that was very successful. This is Adam. He began to take this job very, very seriously and became huge, a uh, huge asset to the staff in the hospital because he carried with him a notebook where he would write down problems that he saw as he moved through the hospital. This note says, um, three bulbs out in patient registration. And those are light bulbs. And clearly lighting in a hospital is very important to keep people safe as they move through the hospital. And so they, they saw that Adam's attention to detail became an asset a as an employee. This is Adam as he moved into engineering cleaning vents. Um, he kind of loved the kind of mm, cool way he looked when he was geared up. This is Adam's intervention data. And again, we have monthly totals of touching others. And you can see that prior to intervention in October, November, and December, we see touching others twice. Now, this is a low frequency behavior, but it's a very serious behavior because people are fired for it. And then we see that once we engage in the intervention, it drops down to zero. Um, Adam, as an employee, is working in infection control. We had a new problem behavior crop up, and that was that he swore at a patient who accused him of staring at her. His staring really is a part of his inability as a person with autism to understand where or how to look at or around people. He doesn't know that he should not be looking directly at people, and so it's a social skill that we worked on with him. Um, his boss said that she needed to have a conference with him, and during that conference she used an idiom that's frequently used at work where she told him to take the high road with patience. This was very confusing to Adam. He came out of that meeting and he talked about the high road. He said, he said, my bus route comes from this place to that place. I don't know where the high road is. In other words, he took that term, take the high road, as very literal, meaning there's a high road somewhere that my bus should take to bring me to work. He totally misunderstood his interaction with his supervisor. And so we had to help him. His job coach then defined what, we, what was meant by the high road. For Adam, the high road means that if you look at the picture in the upper left-hand corner, it means say I'm sorry, walk away, and call Alyssa and your supervisor. So now Adam knows that if he has an interaction with a patient that's not positive and that upsets him, he should, quote, take the high road by saying I'm sorry, walking away, and calling his supervisor and calling Alyssa. We also said that work was a no bad word environment. 
his mom was a real help to us in helping us drive this message home. Um, and so you can see we used visual supports to assist Adam in engaging in these behaviors. At the top of the picture, in the lower right hand corner, what you see is a picture graphic display of public space. And what we did for Adam is we wanted him to understand that work was the place for public space and that's what we meant by be professional. Be professional means that you have public space or social space, that you never engage in personal or intimate space at work. So we capitalized on, um, on Adam's and Terry's strengths at work. We have to be very clear in our communication for, uh, for employees with autism spectrum disorder. We engage in a lot of social skill instruction. For both Adam and Terry, we regularly taught them things such as how to accept correction and what the high road was and what it means to be professional. And when we teach these concepts, we define them behaviorally. For Adam, professional means hands to myself and social space. For Terry, accept correction is a four-step process. We make these concepts that are difficult to understand very concrete. We also look out for, for workplace bullies. In fact, our students with ASD and then our employees with ASD are excellent workers and really desire to please others. And so they, they become somewhat prime targets for, for bullies and so we have to look out for that. We look at the environment by designing the environment. I have a few examples that I'll show you momentarily. And then when it comes to behavior challenges, we really try to understand what's happening with the individual, what's underneath the behavior on top. In the example of Terry's crying, we want to understand what's the crying for, what's the function of the crying. And then we prevent the problem behavior, we teach new skills, and we teach the person to manage their own behavior. This is a very important aspect of the work that we do in an, an employment environment because we can't be there one-on-one -on -one with, with these employees helping them engage, um, complete their task. Some of the visual supports that we use are depicted on the screen right now. On the left side of the screen, you'll see the incredible five-point scale. And in this case, this was a support that we, we developed for someone else who has difficulty with voice volume in the hospital. And we worked with them to understand that they could go as high as three, but four and five was not allowed in the hospital. You'll see another example of a visual support on the right-hand side of the screen. And this describes what someone should do if they get frustrated in, at work. And it has four easy steps that they can follow when they become frustrated at work. On the, on the left hand side of the screen you'll see um, rules for someone at work who's learning to be professional, um, do, complete work before taking a break, and not engage in silly talk or girlish talk. Uh, on the right hand side of the screen you'll see a visual support for the elevator rules and by the way each of these are small cards that could fit in an employee's um, breast pocket of their scrubs. When our interns are at work and then when they become employees they wear a scrub so they frequently don't have pockets. So these supports are not something that we carry around on big clipboards. These are zoomed in and they're tiny little cards that fit in a pocket. This is set the setting up of a workstation for one of our individuals at work and it's a relatively clear packet with oh about 14 or 15 different elements. And so this person is collating these packets for this floor and it's in a relatively distraction free area. You can see her job coach is working with her on the right hand side of the screen and then she's working independently on the left hand side of the screen because the way that the um, job is set up, she can complete this independently. Um, again, we sometimes use visual schedules and in the lower right hand corner you can see a schedule where this individual is um, has actual pictures that, that she's working from and this assists her in understanding what her job tasks are. The, um, the, in the upper left hand corner you can see again the work rules. Work first, then sit, be professional, and no silly talk. 
Thank you again for joining us during this webcast. It has been my goal today to present to you the ways we deal with challenging behavior in the workplace for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. If you are joining us live today, I will be able to join you in the chat room momentarily. If you are viewing this um, after the fact, I thank you for viewing this webcast and I hope you found it helpful in your work. Have a good day.